Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, before we start, let me tell you briefly what and, and who to expect on your screen. Um, my name is Natalie Walker. I'm the manager of college operations at the Classic Learning Test, and I'm so glad you found your way here this evening. Um, after the lecture, there will be a question period, and we want to read your questions in the chat and get the chance to engage with them. Um, so please use the chat freely. Try to address everyone, or at least hosts and panelists. Um, we want to hear from you. Uh, we'll also hear thoughts and questions from two very special guests, CLT test takers and soon to be interns at the CLT. Um, so we're so proud to have them with us, Charlotte and Blake. Thank you for, both for being here. I look forward to listening to you tonight, talking high with you and um, working with you soon. And the main event, of course, is a lecture on F.A. Hayek from Dr. R. Keith Lofton, who is a professor of philosophy at and the Director of Politics, Philosophy, Economics Program at Dallas Baptist University. Um, since you're drawn to this seminar, whether you're joining us live or watching the recording, I know that you would appreciate the PPE program in the university um, like we do here at the CLT. Uh, so Dr. Lofton, thank you for this. Thanks for your time um, turning it over to you. Uh, perhaps before you start or as you're starting to share your screen, you could give a minute to describing Dallas Baptist and the PPE program sure. while you start. Let's see. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. And, and I appreciate the opportunity to join you this evening. Um, my name is Keith Lofton. I am professor of philosophy and chair of the department and director of our program in PPE, politics, philosophy, economics. We've got a terrific PPE community here. We're we're working obviously at the intersection of those three disciplines, but also looking at um, complex problems that I think intimidate a lot of um, a lot of people today. Uh, we think of the war in Ukraine; it, it is an economic problem, it is a moral problem, it's a very great variety of types of problems. But this is precisely why we need people who are trained in more than simply economics or simply this or that. Uh, PPE was designed at Oxford in the last century to take on just these kinds of problems, really an intellectual versatility. But here at DBU, of course, we also are at great pains to do these things in the service of uh, the Lord Jesus. So um, love our program. I'd, I'd love to hear from anyone who would like more info. I'm, I'd welcome emails from any and all. Uh, Robert L-O, R-O-B-E-R-T-L-O at dbu.edu. Thank you so much. Shall I, shall I go ahead and jump into it? Yes, the we can see your screen. All looks right. Good. Well, we'll talk about Friedrich Hayek, and I I just put on the title slide here a, a quick title based on the title of the chapter of the book that we'll be looking at. We'll talk about uh, Friedrich Hayek's uh, book, The Road to Serfdom, um, in particular focus on chapter four, which is called the so-called or the quote unquote inevitability of planning. I thought before we turn to our text that I would tell you a little bit about uh, who Friedrich Hayek is. I think it'll be fruitful to have have a little bit of an on-ramp to the chapter before we just dive straight into it, if that's all right. All right, so I'll just begin by briefly introducing uh, Hayek, and then we'll move to a discussion of planning. So Friedrich August von Hayek, that's an awesome name. And he was born in May of 1899 in Vienna, Austria. He was born actually just about six months after uh, C.S. Lewis, who I mentioned really for no reason other than to help, uh, I think, a lot of listeners in our audience peg Friedrich Hayek on their sort of mental timeline. Um, having mentioned him, I'll say, as far as I know, Lewis and Hayek never met. Um, but they were both in England for the duration of World War II. And they, although working in different disciplines, they were both concerned to uh, do what they could against the encroachment, encroaching ideology of totalitarianism. Um, Hayek studied at the University of Vienna. He uh, wound up earning, in fact, two doctorate degrees. The first was in law. This was in 1921. And then the next was only a quick two years later in 
political economy. This was in 1923. And when he finished his second doctorate, he was 24 years old, which I find just absolutely astonishing. While at university, uh, Hayek was influenced by two noteworthy economists here, uh, Friedrich von Wiesner and then uh, Ludwig von Mises. These I mentioned because they were um, they, what you could think of as sort of two of the founders of the so-called uh, Austrian school of economics. And they're noteworthy for two reasons here. First, because Hayek himself became convinced of the, the approach to economics that is associated with the Austrian school. In fact, he would go on later in his career, having espoused it to become really the preeminent champion of Austrian economics. And also because that school, um, sort of the, some of the main planks in their platform will be featured centrally in our text here uh, shortly. Well, maybe I should say, what is the Austrian school uh, in a little bit more detail? I'm sure people will be wondering that. In short, it's an approach to economics, especially the post-World War II iteration of the school that tends to champion free market economics. They will tend to champion, of course, free enterprise. They, uh, the Austrian school tends to regard individuals' choices and, and actions as really the central, the central thing in economic uh, exchanges in the marketplace. The Austrian school, and really this last element is, is the critical thing that they focus, they give priority to individuals' choices and actions um, in the market, and that will be really critical to our discussion in chapter four. Well, thereafter, for two decades, uh, Hayek found himself in London at the London School of Economics, actually early in 1931. He came over to give a short series of talks at the London School, and um, I guess impressed the right people, for he was offered uh, a job there, which he wound up holding for two decades. So he must have done really quite impressive work. Uh, he became, during this period, uh, his period in London, he became recognized really as a, as a one of the foremost critics of uh, socialist thought, as well as, uh, as, a, as a preeminent critic of a certain type of planning, more on that momentarily. Uh, but it was also during this period, while he was at the London School in uh, 1944, to be precise, that our text for the evening was published. The Road to Serfdom uh, came out in uh, Europe early in 1944 and then in the United States later uh, in the same year. In 1950, uh, Hayek found himself transitioning to the U.S. He came to the University of uh, Chicago, where he joined a community that included uh, a couple of other, several other really um, well-known uh, economists. Uh, Milton Friedman was there in this period. And then just a little while, a short period later, George Stiegler, the great economist George Stiegler, uh, was there. There were other great economists, but Hayek found in Stiegler and Hayek um, kindred spirits and um, constructively critical brethren in his uh, work against planning. Um, and I think I'll just mention also, well, you, you mustn't leave out something of this import, that uh, in 1974, Hayek did win the Nobel Prize in economics. According to the Nobel Foundation, he won this for his work on the theory of money and also for his work on economic fluctuations, but also for his work on uh, identifying and explaining the interplay between economic and social and, and institutional phenomena. So he was really, uh, really a versatile thinker, which I appreciate about him. And finally, Hayek uh, passed away in March of 1992, having retired uh, to live in Freiburg, Germany. <clears throat> so the book, The Road to Serfdom, this is the edition from which uh, the text for the evening is, is taken. Um, the Road to Serfdom was written in a particularly interesting context, uh, historical context. I'll, I'm going to constrain myself to mentioning only two elements of this context because they're directly applicable to what I want to focus on. 
Uh, the first is, uh, I'm just summing up under the name, uh, John Maynard Keynes. I, I hate to lay all the sins of an entire movement at the feet of one poor man, but here we are with the bullet points. What shall I do? Uh, John Maynard Keynes was an enormously influential economist in, in England long before um, 1931 when um, Hayek finds his way there. John Maynard Keynes had been involved in um, the, the English government for some time. He was there in uh, Paris in 1919 as uh, the, 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 the post-World War I uh, discussions and negotiations and treaty writing were taking place. So he was he was well known already. And so Keynes is good, I think, a good focal point for the ideas that I want to focus on here. These are the ideas that greater increased government intervention in the market is necessary to, I guess, facilitating a healthy economy, especially when that's defined in terms of having low unemployment, a particular concern of, uh, of Keynes there in the early 30s. Um, Keynes is strictly opposed to what we think of as laissez-faire economics today. He's he believes that the government and uh, specifically not individuals, um, free actions and choices are you know choices made on self-interest, but rather the government is what is needed to stimulate the economy. The government is who is best or what is best positioned. He would say, I think to um, to know what is best in terms of choice making in the economy. Um, at that time, Hayek and, and thinkers like him had just lost confidence that um, they had lost confidence that the myriad of free choices people make in the marketplace, where that is safeguarded by the rule of law, they've lost confidence that this mechanism will over time uh, tend to benefit everyone. And Hayek is, simply put, quite exercised and deeply opposed uh, to these ideas. Uh, a second important part of the context here is the rise in Germany of uh, what Hayek called Nazi socialism, German national socialism. There are various labels. The rise of German national or, or Nazi socialism was huge international news. The geopolitical events of the 1930s, and you must remember this is before the outbreak of World War II, these were huge, huge news internationally. But really a particular interest to con or concern to Hayek were what he called the anti-liberal and anti-capitalist trend in Germany at the time, which aimed to really supplant capitalist thought with uh, was often then called collectivism. Think of that as just the opposite of individualism, the sort of individual thought that Hayek champions. And Hayek, of course, had a number of concerns about these trends, but as he, as he wrote in, um, in a short memorandum in 1933, simply titled Nazi Socialism, uh, he wrote simply, the inherent logic of collectivism makes it impossible to confine it to a limited sphere. Beyond certain limits, collective action in the interest of all can only be made possible if all can be coerced into accepting as their common interest what those in power take it to be. And so uh, Hayek is particularly concerned about what this will mean for the diminishment of individual free thought and the rise of what will ultimately be totalitarianism. And so this context, I, I hope, sets us up to appreciate what uh, Hayek says in the 1956, uh, the forward to the 1956 edition of The Road to Serfdom. He says that the book is, quote, a warning to the socialist intelligentsia of England. It's a warning, in other words, to Keynes himself and to those who follow uh, and, and thought patterns like unto those of Keynes and his crowd, uh, uh, Hayek is warning them that their economic thinking is not isolated from real world political outcomes, social consequences. So this is basically the argument Hayek is making in The Road to Serfdom in its totality. Uh, he says all, later in the forward to the 56th edition, 
uh, he, uh, yes, I'll give you the quote here. It says, only if we understand why and how certain kinds of economic controls tend to paralyze the driving forces of a free society, and also which kinds of measures are particularly dangerous in this respect, only then can we hope that social experimentation will not lead us into situations none of us want. And so he is concerned that the direction in which Keynes and those who follow him would lead society will, will um, fall prey to this kind of uh, uh, direction. All right, so it feels like that's super fast, but all of that to set up uh, the, the fourth chapter of The Road to Seraphim, which was our uh, chosen text for this evening. So planning, what is that? Uh, what, what is he talking about? It, to be clear, Hayek is not against the practice of making plans and having plans. I, I hope that all of the students who listen to this lecture later will be making careful and uh, wisdom-infused plans. So when, when Hayek uh, has things to say critical of planning, he means a particular kind of planning. And so I wanna set that up by just a quick dip back into chapter three. In chapter three of The Road to Serfdom, Hayek links uh, socialism to the creation of a what he calls a planned economy. What he has in mind is a planned economy in which he says the entrepreneur who is working for profit is replaced by some, uh, some sort of central planning body. If you have the book with you, that'll be on page 83 of The Road to Serfdom. And so the planning that Hayek is concerned with here is centralized planning, not the sort of common sense, uh, your parents taught you well uh, planning that, that we experience and in, in advance in our lives. Centralized planning, that is the sort of planning that is desired by socialism as a, as a good shorthand. He in fact offers us a decent definition in chapter three of this book, he says, uh, uh, central or centralized planning or, is centrally directing all economic activity according to a single plan, uh, laying down how the resources of a society should be uh, consciously directed um, to serve particular ends, particular purposes in a definite way. So where this is uh, set up both in terms of defining the end and identifying the means, the pathway toward achieving that is is laid out by this central body and not left in the hands of the many. So this idea, this centralized planning is, Hayek will think, especially pernicious when it comes to, or sort of especially pernicious because it um, undermines or discourages competition. For Hayek, competition is the, the critical key, the central key to having a successful economy. Uh, why is he worried about this? He thinks, you know, why would any of us uh, compete in the market if central planning, central planners will deliver or alternatively deny to any of us income, say, or the realization of any of our individual interest? And so Hack regards this as a, as a terribly bad and that central planning would replace ultimately planning. So do new problems caused by modern industrial civilization require central planning? This is, a, as the chapter opens, Hayek chapter four, Hayek is concerned to show that those who argue that planning is inevitable are mistaken. On the one hand, some detractors, he imagines, some have claimed that planning, centralized planning is inevitable because the advances in technology, which are even more astonishing now, uh, you know, generations after Hayek has passed, these advances in technology are just inevitably leading to the crowding out of competition. He, you know, he uses uh, farming as an example, that there used to be all these little mom and pop run farms, and then industrial farming comes along, and they can just price small competitors right out of the market so that the small uh, mom and pop farms like where I grew up they just get gobbled up by the big industrial farms and so that there are then a handful of uh, monopoly comprising uh, farms and that this something inevitably leads to planning these 
industrial farms require lots of central planning. Um, well, he makes quick work of this objection. He uh, uh, points out and uh, cites evidence to the end that uh, facts, the fact of the matter and experience has demonstrated that this claim is just mistaken, that this is not the case, except for that it has been bolstered by pro-planning policies. But he argues when the pro-planning policies of society are stripped away, that it just isn't the case that um, advanced complexity and technology entails um, planning. But then beginning on the top of page 95, I think the chapter gets very interesting. On beginning on page 95, Hayek considers the possibility that maybe his detractors meant the objection in a different, more interesting way. He imagines that maybe the objection could be taken to mean that planning is, in it, is inevitable, excuse me, on the grounds that, as he puts it, the complexity of our modern industrial civilization, the, the very way in which we are organizing ourselves uh, is, as civilization, will create new problems of a sort which uh, we cannot deal with except by uh, entrusting these matters to the, the hands of some central planning body. Now, this question, or maybe this way of interpreting the objection, is what occasions Hayek's main argument in chapter four. So just looking at the rest of the paragraph on, as this is on the top of page 95, <clears throat> you may wonder why would anyone think that the, that there would be problems such that they would lead to planning inevitably. I think what he is envisioning here, what he what he has in mind as a possible objection is that something like this. The idea is that as civilization becomes increasingly advanced and complex and intermingled, that the mechanism of competition, which worked for generations before, that mechanism of competition just is is no longer capable of or, or adequate to the task of providing a clear comprehensive view of of civilization's economic process so this worked in the past but now we've developed and advanced in such complex ways that we find ourselves in demand of something more capable than competition the, uh, the idea in other words there's just, just too much going on involving too many people in too many uh, increasingly intricate ways for us to rely on competition. Surely it is thought um, all this demands that we empower some central body, some central agency to coordinate uh, economic activity. And so now Hayek is having reinterpreted the objection in these terms. He wants to undermine it. <clears throat> well, Hayek agrees that Civilization is growing very complicated. And golly, if he were here for the emergence of AI, things like AI and so forth, I, I think he would be happy to um, agree. Certainly, I think he would stipulate happily that, yep, civilization is getting a lot more complex. Societies, I mean, towns are just right on top of each other. Now here, the Metroplex, Dallas Fort Worth that I live in is, a, a, it's a, it's almost a metropolis. It's, it's so huge and complicated. But therein lies the rub, I think Hayek will be happy to say, because it is, it, it is the, the very growth of complexity itself that commends to us, Hayek says, a comp it's the complexity itself that commends to us competition as the key to turning this lock. It's the right tool for the job. He says on page 95 that uh, it is the very complexity of the division of labor under modern conditions, which makes competition the only method by which such coordination can be adequately brought about. So this forces us to think about what is he talking about by coordination? I, I think most people uh, unfamiliar with uh, a lot of economic writing won't really, I think, get what he means by this. Let me just say a word about coordination. The coordination that Hayek has in mind is not the ability to walk and chew bubble gum at the same time or walk and bounce a basketball without kicking it at the same time. It's, it's a different kind of coordination. What he's talking about is, a, is a, think of it as a state of affairs or, or a situation 
in which people's interests are satisfied. Um, you must do something and I must do something in order for us to bring it about for one another that we are satisfying one another's interest. If what you want is a, a fresh baked loaf of bread and what I want is to, to bake and sell loaves of bread, then we need to coordinate our actions to enter into a, a, a situation of sale, right? I mean, church it up a little now for us. Uh, a coordination is a situation in which individual people um, spend their resources. And here I mean, of course, their money, but also importantly, their time, things which are scarce uh, and, and in which they direct their labor in ways that meet the demands of other people. So how does that happen? Though? I mean, how does it come to be that I, a bread maker, and you, a bread desire desirer this is not technical talk <laughs> how does it come to be that we meet at a place where a point of sale can be achieved i we don't even know each other i don't even know where you're located or even that you exist so how can this happen when no one is centrally organizing everything well says hayek it happens by way of the mechanism of competition so this is this is what he has in mind well why why is this the best way to achieve coordination, according to Hayek? Right. What he says on in the, in the chapter is that the magic is in the off-overlooked or taken-for-granted um, uh, fact of knowledge. But what he talks about, you know, he often calls this knowledge. In fact, late, uh, the next year after this book came out, he wrote a, what's become a very famous article where he expands on his thought here in chapter four articles is called the use of knowledge in society you should have no problem finding it on uh google yeah, quickly it's, it's such a wonderful thought-provoking article i want to encourage everyone to have a look at it so what he's saying is that when people think about the economy if they assume that someone or some agency or some committee say if we assume that that committee or that agency knows everything that needs to be known, then working out a, a centrally planned or or an, an economic order is really a, it's a simply a logic problem. It's nothing more than a logic problem. <clears throat> if you grant that all of the um, knowledge which is involved or relevant to the economy is available, then it's just a matter of finding someone, you know, sufficiently smart, maybe these two interns, just, just put them to work at the controls and they can sort of centrally plan the economy, right? I mean, sure, that what could make more sense than that? But this is where uh, the rub comes, according to Hayek. The trouble is that this is emphatically not the, the nature of the problem that society faces. The economic calculus, which we have developed to solve this logical problem, would be really cool and hey maybe we do have a computing mechanism capable of that kind of a, of an effort but the problem is not a, a smart enough problem or a smart enough person problem the problem is that the data the knowledge which must be known in order to carry out this kind of um logical planning of the economy is simply not given for the whole society uh, the information of all of my interests and all of your interests and all of your resources and mine and your the choices which you freely wish to make in connection with all these things, that, as we'll put it, data just is not given. It is not available anywhere for the entire society. Um, it's, it's not available to a given mind. It's not that it is available, but the government's keeping it under lock and key or password or encryption. It's, it's not concentratable to be made available to the, the really smart interns here. And that's the kind of problem. This is the so-called knowledge problem in, in, in simple form. It's not that human beings are too stupid to figure it out. The, the problem with setting up someone or something or some committee as a central planner, Hayek says, is that, again, the relevant knowledge that we need to pull it off is never concentrated in a single mind. It's it's, it's far too widely dispersed. I, I hope that makes sense. 
so so the sort of the peculiar problem the peculiar nature of the problem of the economic order is precisely the fact that the knowledge of all the relevant circumstances of which you must make use to centrally plan is not available it's it's dispersed in my home between my wife and me or in your home or in your dorm room or wherever there is no way that we even could even if we had nationwide meetings twice a week we couldn't pull this off not only because it would just be sh the sheer volume is over over matched for us that it changes constantly think of the demands of a simple supply chain there's a famous essay called i pencil which i i just punch into google i comma pencil and read this wonderful essay nobody knows how to make a number two pencil i mean who doesn't have a number two pencil at their desk but no one knows how to make it. No one's coordinating all the people who have information relevant to making their, you know, collecting the bauxite, bringing together the wood in a certain way from a certain forest. Like, no one knows how to even pull off the supply chain individually. It involves multiple countries. Um, and so this is the this is the problem. The problem of, of knowledge is that it is too widely diffused and too frequently changing for anyone to get mastery of it. So sure, if we grant that the knowledge is there, all we need is a really smart program, a really smart person or intern to pull it off. But the data is not, not uh, ascertainable in that way. It's, it's not uh, knowable in its totality. And so that's really the, the crux of chapter four. I think the reason why central planning won't work is, is multifold. He has political concerns about it so, as, as a potential quick pathway to uh, totalitarianism. Uh, he has philosophical objections to it and, and what this would imply for um, human freedom. But the real crux of chapter four of the road to serfdom is that economically, it's pie in the sky. There cannot be a centrally planned economy. And I'm teaching a course here at DBU this semester on Cold War strategies. It's not an economics course, but that comes up. And as is evident from uh, a close look at the USSR's fate economically in um, you know, the past uh, century. This has been tried, um, I think, by people perhaps as capable as anyone else, and it is just not possible. Okay, so I, I, I hope that I've here left plenty of time to uh, talk about it and, and see which way, which way discussion may take us as we, as we think further about this chapter. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Lefton. Um, yes, I'm glad we have equal time to ask you questions. Uh, either Blake or Charlotte, would you like to start us off? I'm sure you have questions both about the lecture and you read um, this chapter in advance, so you may have come with questions already. Charlotte can go first. I'm, <clears throat> I'm coordinating my ideas. Well, while you all are thinking, mm -hmm. I guess there's a series of questions I could ask, I guess, um, about, yeah. I feel like reading economics, it's a real exercise in imagination to kind of think on this really large scale about, yeah, what is coordination? What really are the complexities? So I was wondering if you could just give us maybe a little more texture for, um, the the complexities that make the coordination impossible for Hayek. You mentioned supply chains, yeah. but that seems like the kind of knowledge we could collect. Mm -hmm. um, like with so, technology, things get more sure. complicated, but they also get uh, data in a way gets easier in tracking. Yeah. So yeah, you can log right. data right every time we pull off a successful cycle of a supply chain. We can we can know more about it but let's just um and i i don't want you to think that i'm being pedantic in this answer but i'm going to appeal to the insights from i pencil to summarize the kind of complexity we're talking about here i know what a number two pencil does what what we used to call its final cause and that's really about it and in fact 
There is again, no one who knows. Why is that? Because the knowledge involved in making what, what otherwise would seem to be one of the simplest devices here on my desk. I've got before me a couple of computers and uh, an insulated mug with coffee in it. And I mean, all kinds of coffee, but I also have a number two pencil and um, that's what makes it a great illustration for this. The knowledge which goes into the production of a number two pencil is absolutely astonishing in its complexity, even though we think of it in our sneering modern way, a modern way is simple. It, first of all, it's not lead that is in a lead pencil at all. And that comes from ore, which is um, produced in several countries, uh, China, for example. Um, well, the people who are mining the ore from which we ultimately create bauxite, they have no idea what it's going to be used for. And frankly, they don't care. Uh, this is no, no slight to the miners in China. Uh, my dad is involved in home construction in Louisiana, and it's not that he's a, an ugly or disinterested person, but he doesn't really care what use you're going to put your home to. Uh, what does living here mean for the family? It doesn't, doesn't really concern him. Um, so the miners, think of the knowledge that goes into simply locating, um, planning, and executing, pulling off the mining of this ore and then getting it from the ground to places where it will be used in you know, various applications. It will be refined in various ways and then shipped. Then by other people who know things that I don't have any earthly idea how to pull off, how to get, how to simply get mined ore safely from one place to another, let alone when and where to do this. Um, think of the, the fuel, the logistics that go into the simply the shipping of this one component part. <clears throat> the people shipping it don't care who put it on the train and who's taking it off and for what purpose they're going to put it to. It doesn't matter to them. Then the wood that goes into uh, which trees, this they come oftentimes from uh, great forest in the, the Nevada, California reason, region. Uh, the people who are cutting these trees down and uh, removing them from the forest and bringing them to market have no idea and not a care in the world why they're doing it. They, 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 well, they know why they're doing it for a paycheck so that they can go home and buy their uh, little boy uh, an ice cream cone and pay the rent, right? Um, they have not, they, the last thing in the world on their mind is the production of a number two pencil. And then there are factories that refine the wood and, you know, uh, produce the the shafts, which are then split. And then they, those are shipped on and sold to finally a production facility for the creation of pencils. Just think how complicated this is. And yet, no one who is involved in any step along the way, whether in supply chain, refinement, production, none of them are intentionally aiming their actions at the production of a number two pencil. And so this is a, I mean, a, a very quick sort of a rough and ready illustration of the type of knowledge. I didn't think in the market, you know, the fact that we have grocery stores is a jaw-dropping reality. It's It's amazing. How do producers know what what and how much of a, an item to sell or manufacture in order not to go out of business? Well, there must be some way of them reading the desires of uh, us, the, the buyers. Well, this is done in the context of competition and it's conveyed by the price, what we call the price system. So you can almost think of price system and, and um competition as, as interchangeable for our purposes here. And so these are the type of things I I don't call farmers anywhere in the country and warn them of when my family is going to need a certain amount of bread and milk, you know, and the and on what timetable. And I bet you don't either. And yet we don't find ourselves uh massively overstocked to the point that we have an excess of spoilage and we we find that we don't have tremendous shortages that last a significant amount of time for these products. So it's the it's the mechanism of competition of the price system, which Hayek insists must be 
the only possible mechanism for signaling these things successfully in the market. Nobody could possibly keep the trains running on time in terms of um, those signals in a central way. I don't hope that satisfies. That's great. Well, we have a pending question from Blake, and then we have a, a great question in the Q&A that I'll ask after, after he goes. Yes. So I was just thinking of what are some maybe arguments that the central planning advocates would say? And I, I just thought of two. So first off, <laughs> Uh, we have like a lot of central planning committees and we don't really complain about them. For example, we have a central government <laughs> and we have a central uh, kind of legislative, I mean, a judicial branch. Uh, we create laws, we elect officials, we work on policy, and we also interpret laws and determine who's guilty and not guilty on a central idea. And I can tell you the those are very complex. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the legislators deal with a lot of different issues and complexity, um, and, but also judges look in complexity of certain situations, yet it still works. Why, why is the economy no different? What sure. Well, it works a lot of the time, doesn't it? And I uh, just want to remind you, this is recorded. And so you'll have the opportunity in 10 years when you've got a job that involves committees to revisit your um, assertion that committees work. <laughs> Actually, um, uh, for my boss, who will inevitably watch this one day, I love all of my committee work and would have nothing nothing else. And they always work. But of course, at other schools where I've been, um, sometimes they're they're less productive and effective. But setting that aside, yeah. So I wonder how tight is the analogy uh, the the analogy really between those sorts of examples and uh, the sort of centralized planning that we're envisioning here. I think that might be where the rub comes, that the analogy doesn't work if we push on it very far. Yeah, the the work of, say, a judge in the court system, that's centrally planned in the sense that it's been delegated to them by the rest of us. And we don't involve the population at large in all of these matters. But as the kind of knowledge which the systems you have uh, noted, is it really analogous to the type of knowledge that Hayek is talking about? And I think the answer here is going to be uh, no. It's not to take anything away from the legislation, uh, the legislative branch, the executive branch, the judiciary, and so forth. They, they're they wonderful. And I think, uh, at least in theory, critical to the type of democracy, the democratic republic we enjoy. But that kind of knowledge is not the kind of knowledge that turns quickly, often just at a moment's notice, based on the decentralized interest and resources of the masses, right? I don't, I've never had a role in any legal proceeding, uh, knock on wood, but I, even at the moment, I think I have a pretty good idea of what to expect, who to expect it from, and how the judge will handle the input from both, say, myself and, you know, whoever's across the bar, because there are tightly prescribed rules. It's not um, my interest and the other party's interest are not meeting in the kind of economic exchange that we envision in the marketplace. It's a lot closer to a straight up zero sum whenever it's, uh, you know, proceeding in that phase. So I think... Um, our framing fathers had great wisdom in limiting to very low numbers, actually, how many people are in the Congress. I don't want to chase a rabbit trail you didn't really raise any further than is necessary or fun. But I, I've had just a flash here thinking of the French Revolution with a rapid succession, a handful of what we'll generously call governments. Um, think of like gatherings of 5,000 who are given the task of accomplishing this, that, and the other. And it's, and it's, it's absurd because you cannot bring it about. It will wind up looking like a horse designed by a committee. Yeah. So does that satisfy or would you, would you want to sharpen it up and follow up? Yes. I think it's uh, pretty good. You know, like legal proceedings work on objective, mostly unchanging ideas. Like yeah. A man murdered another man. That's not going to change. Whereas the economy varies in multiple different circumstances. Right. It's the, it's the type of knowledge. That's the key. 
Interesting. So I have another argument I think a lot of people would say too is we don't need to know everything in order to yeah. make a good uh, like prediction and planning. Like for example, we uh, when we make uh, scientific experiments, sometimes we leave out air resistance or quantum uh, uncertainty, but we can still get to good conclusions and estimations. And we can create a good model that represents the program. Um, I, and a lot of central planning organizations do that. Like they have like the central body says, here's our goals. And um, since as the individuals, all right, achieve these goals, like produce X amount or whatnot. And if you uh, failure to do so, well, we'll find an individual who is better able to produce. Yeah. Uh, why does this uh, model or central system fail? Or in yeah. highest idea. Or why wouldn't that work in the market economy framework where why won't that work when all of these sources of input are unique and uniquely situated with non-overlapping interests, I think is precisely, again, the rub where we find the analogy breaks down when it comes to, say, scientific or industrial thinking like great industrial machinery that produces you know very rapidly and efficiently because it's sort of centrally controlled by a programmer of some kind say it's because there is tremendous consistency in right the model is only good in the lab it's proofs in the pudding right when, you, when it goes live and must work on scale that that analogy if, if i if I, ho I hope that comes across as analogous that's where it breaks down right because here in in the market it would only be a, a proper analogy if all of the input say your desires and aims and talents and uh time and ways you're willing to spend your time and so forth are uh what's i just lost the word when where it is sort of um becomes fixed in a way that makes it a continuous input and everyone else's input matches or, or, or is uh, like in kind. But I think this is where the analogy again just doesn't quite hold up um, to to the to our imagined uh, naysayer. Um, sure, yes, in theory, if we could know all of the inputs, all of the what Heifel's knowledge, then yes, it could it could very well be that a, a, a astonishingly clever machine with a really sharp, you know, programmer could pull it off. But again, that's the thing. I mean. What is a machine that just takes in unique and rapidly changing uh, knowledge? And even the desired end or productive output of the machine is is not definable, given given that knowledge is what Hayek says it is in the economy. Yeah. You'd have to know things as 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 minuscule as like when a certain number of workers. Uh, who are mining a certain ore in, you know, Ecuador will be sick or will be unavailable. I mean, this this is just not predictable. It's not knowable, the way Hayek's using the term. Yeah, those are good, though. I do think those are some of the commonplace um, I think objections, but really just mis misapprehension of the kind of thing Hayek is describing the economy to be. Thank you, Blake. Uh, there's a question about, um, yeah, what the economy is understood to be by Hayek in the chat from Eric. So he's wondering if Hayek understood the economy as something that serves a people or something that serves itself, the latter being like what it seems when systems are purely profit oriented. Um, so he gives an example. He asks, why keep a factory in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, or McAdoo, Pennsylvania, if it's cheaper to move it to Mexico, how does Hayek think about that? Well, there's a it's a really interesting question, I, and it's a I think a great question because it invites a few different lines of uh, consideration. So, <clears throat> I want to get the wording of the first bit right. Does the economy serve its own ends or the ends of us individually? Um, he says a people, which I took a to people. be okay, a yeah. country. Yeah, that's great. So 
I think, and I again, I, I always feel that there's a risk when you answer these kind of questions of coming across as a pedant, and I, I am not trying to be pedantic in answering these. Just want to just want to try to be precise if I can. We we must be careful not to personify or sort of reify in the wrong way the economy. You know, it's not there's there's no thing out there the economy that even could serve you know me and you and and all of our you know compatriots here in the country it, there there it, you know there's not the economy in the same way that there's like the government you know it makes really straightforward sense to say that the government theoretically serves us but that that doesn't really map onto the economic discussion i think is cleanly because there's no the economy reified think the if the economy really picks out anything it is the jaw-droppingly complicated ongoing process of human interaction when i went to buy a coffee before this that was the economy when you acquired the technology that made it possible for here now a second thing your expenditure of your scarce resource your time to participate here with us those are are the economy but there is no you know economy that even could serve us i think hayek would encourage us to think of the economy as a shorthand way of referring to the grand collection of all all of our various decisions about how to act with one another in pursuit of our various unique, um, very personal interest, and uh, that is to say our self-interest. Now, sometimes people get nervous that we're implying that everyone is selfish. Well, yes, I, I think that is what he's implying. I mean, I'm a Christian. I uh, we are we uh, in in the faith we believe that uh, selfishness comes in some really nasty shapes and forms, but it's not quite identical. I don't I don't like selfish as interchangeable with self interest. Um, my self interest includes the the uh, care and protection for my um, first grade son and my wife and even our uh, oftentimes annoying doggy Winston. We do love him anyway. Um, so those are my interests, but it's not that you're a, you're a jerk or a monster of any kind. But you're just you're just not choosing to spend your resources and your labor and your your time and so forth in the furtherance of any of the things that I just enumerated as my interests. I get. I'm sure you'd love my son Ian. He's a good boy, and you guys probably hit it off fast, but. You don't know him, and so you're not spending your, you're not directing your economic engagement with my interest in mind, and you shouldn't, because it, it works great, Hayek says, when in the pursuit of your interests and the expenditure of your resources as you freely choose, you enter the market, and competition, the price system, allows you and others in the market to send signals blindly so we are able to eliminate in the system uh, a good deal of uh, bias and racism and uh, biases of other kinds because you don't you don't know who is going to be say the purchaser of your um, manufacturer and the, the recipient of your whatever and so I think yes because it is ultimately really us that we're talking about when we use the nomenclature of the economy. We must say that the economy exists to serve us because we are serving ourselves and one another in these uh, free exchanges. And then I, I the factory. Uh, as I understood it, the question is, would Hayek advise you if you have, say, a factory in um, small town USA to relocate it to small town somewhere outside of the, the country, perhaps it was Mexico or China or India, um, if that can be done at a cheaper price. That's a tricky question because a lot goes into it and a, a, a short yes or no will invariably be uh, fraught with undesirable baggage. 
Uh, and, and in particularly, I think sometimes people infuse moral considerations into this. Ought you to relocate your, uh, um, your factory? Well, I'm going to broaden the example because there's a really interesting discussion of tariffs in the neighborhood here, and it's a timely question because at least one of our political candidates vying for president has um, settled a lot of interesting things about tariffs of late. Um, tariffs and uh, are, are a tricky thing because you are um, declining the opportunity to enter into a market that extends beyond our borders. Yeah, if you can increase the productivity of your business enterprise by not only reducing your overhead costs, but perhaps by putting it in the hands of more skilled workers or really freeing up the hands of your skilled employees here, then a number of thinkers in the Austrian school, certainly I, I think Milton Friedman would say, yeah, you should really consider Remember, like, why wouldn't you relocate your um, factory overseas? Well, I mean, if there are a willing and able workers out overseas who can produce what you have designed at a, at a favorable rate, then yes, the market here will probably enjoy, appreciate the benefit of being able to purchase your product produce more cheaply while ourselves not being tied up in that productive process. And we may uh, be able to apply ourselves to something that is not easily um, uh, re removed to process overseas. So I, I don't want to attribute, as you may see here, I don't want to attribute to Hayek a, a claim that he hasn't made uh, explicitly to my knowledge. But yeah. I. I think he would be okay with you moving uh, moving your factory. Thank you for a great question, Eric. And, and yeah, thanks nice. for your answer. So I think uh, we'll take time. We have time for one more question. And okay. that's going to be Charlotte's question. Yeah, so this is something you already talked about a little bit, but I just kind of wanted to get your input on it, which is that, so we've talked a little bit about um, what, how technology uh, will interact with these systems that Hayek was talking about and how as technology improves, we might be able to draw closer to having more of a centralized planning committee. Mm -hmm. I was just curious, if that would, were to happen, it would obviously impact uh, the freedom of people involved. And I wonder, what do you think Hayek would consider more important, the benefit of having centralized planning in that scenario or the freedom of people? Well, that's a very good final question, Charlotte. <clears throat> I think I think Hayek would definitely have a lot to say about this question. I appreciate the way you framed it up. The question is not really about the technology, right? Everyone agrees and I think celebrates the, just the incredible advances, like superconductors, semiconductors that the computing ability, the, the, the potential and the potential peril that confronts us with AI, it's incredible. Um, nuclear power, I mean, it's just, there's so much, to, but it's not really about the technology per se, is it? I think Hayek would, I think Hayek would be okay with me saying that he would say, actually the scariest thing about that is that if it were sort of put to a national vote in this country tomorrow, I think a lot of people, especially younger generations, sort of younger than me, would welcome the opportunity to just be free, be, be rid of the necessity of thinking for themselves. I think, I think he would be most concerned that so many people are keen to, as we'll say, outsource their thinking, leaving it in the hands of others, the you know, the, the putative experts. 
these are people who I think Hayek and many, and I think I'm sympathetic to this concern, are just in so many ways taking steps further and further down a road of dehumanizing themselves, right? Part There's a lot of theological things to be said here, but I think even traditionalist thinking of humans in the Aristotelian sense, the Aquinas tradition will be concerned at anyone who not only undervalues their uh, their being a personal soul infused with intellect and so forth, but exercising those faculties is essential to just what it is to be human. And the more you sort of outsource that to others, really the less opportunity that you have to flourish, to be human correctly. And so I think he would at least want that bell to be rung a little bit in answering your question. I think he would, I think he would probably coyly remark that in imagining that technology has been de developed such that this is capable of, you know, a potential outcome is a bit like building a question on the premise about the color of the square root of 13. It's just, could be fun to talk about, but it's, it's not that it hasn't been developed. It's not, it's not developable bull given the nature of the kind of scenario we're talking about. It's, it's not just that we don't have smart enough people who have done it yet. It's not doable given the sort of knowledge, the sort of input that we're talking about here. So yeah, that's a, boy, that's a really interesting question. It seems like there was one more component to that question that I didn't touch on. Did I, what did I leave out there? I mean, it sounds like you answered it pretty well to me. Yeah, I think Hayek would find that really interesting because it does tie in sort of philosophy here with your view of anthropology. All these things, again, are, these are just downstream of anthropology. If you don't know what what is a human being, what is a human being for? I mean, if humans are purposive, if, if we have a final cause, as here the, the Christian and non-Christian traditions have joined forces in insisting, if you don't begin with a grasp of what and for what and for whom are human beings in existence, then of course you're you're hopeless in thinking about how to make sense of their interactions with one another in an economic setting. Yeah, I think what you suggest there, he would be concerned that we're sort of undercutting the very thing that we are meant to be, humans, humans who flourish. Yeah, those are terrific questions. Such good questions, such good discussion. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Lofton. This it's has my been pleasure.